Okay, Chair Price, the meeting is now live. Thank you. Um, so welcome um, everyone to the Environmental Quality Commission's March 17th meeting. This is a teleconference meeting with the EQC members, city staff, and members of the public all participating remotely to ensure proper social distancing in this federal, state, and local emergency. We will start with roll call. Um, and I invite um, Rebecca, the lucky to introduce herself, followed by the uh, commissioners. Good evening, commissioners and members of the public. I am Rebecca Lucky, the sustainability manager for the city of Menlo Park. Thank you. Uh, I am Ryan Price, the chair of the EQC. Um, I'll pass it off to Leah Elkins. I am Leah Elkins. Um, hello. <laughs> and um, next, Deb. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> I just figured I'd go. <laughs> Deb Martin, um, been on the EQC for, well, I'm well, almost uh, at my eight year terms. Next, next month will be my last uh, meeting, sadly. Josie Gaylord, uh, I've, this is my, I wanna say second year. Thank you. I'm James Payne, this is my third year. Yep. And I'm Tom Cabot, it's my third year also with the commission. Thank you. And, um, and uh, uh, Ms. Lucky, would you like to provide instructions to the EQC members and members of the public on how the meeting will proceed? Yes, thank you, Chair Price and members of the Environmental Quality Commission. Welcome everyone to the March 17th regular Environmental Quality Commission meeting and thank you for attending. At this time, we ask that members of the EQC please remain on the screen for the duration of the meeting. You'll be able to control your own webcams and microphones and staff will engage webcams and microphones to make presentations or to respond to questions um, or comments from the Environmental Quality Commission. And for members of the public who are in attendance and wish to provide public comment, after the chair calls for public comment on an item you wish to speak on, please engage the raised hand feature that is next to your name if you click on the participants list. And I'll have the ability to open your microphone and provide, um, and you can provide your public comment to the Environmental Quality Commission. So for those of you who are calling in from a landline or a cell phone, you can press nine star nine to raise your virtual hand and I'll be able to then unmute your microphone. This concludes the instructions and I return the meeting to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lucky. Um, so at this time, we'll start our agenda with um, the public comment. So under public comment, the public may address the EQC on any subject not listed on the agenda. Each speaker may address the EQC once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. Please clearly state your name um, and your address or, or political jurisdiction in which you live. Um, the EQC cannot act on items listed under, not listed on the agenda. Therefore, the EQC cannot respond to non-agenda issues brought up under public comment, other than to provide general information. The floor is now open for public comment. Uh, Rebecca, do we have any public comment, com public comment uh, at this time? Sorry, I can't talk. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> Thank you, Chair Price. I know it is, it can be a mouthful um, in trying to provide instructions. So at this time, again, if, if you'd like to make a comment on an item that is not on the agenda, just use that raised hand feature next to your name. If you're on a landline or a cell phone, you need to press star nine and that will um, allow us to see that you've raised your hand. And with that, I do have two hands raised. Um, the first speaker will be Scott Marshall and the second speaker is on a, um, a phone and has the last four digits 2856. So please be prepared to give your public comment after Mr. Scott Marshall provides his. And Mr. Marshall, I've unmuted you, but I think you may need to unmute yourself in order to speak to the commission. Thank you. 
There you go. Hello, commissioners. Oh, I'm first of all, Scott Marshall, um, Menlo Park uh, resident and a former EQC member. And hello to the commissioners and uh, Rebecca Lucky. Um, I just want to make a comment on the San Francisco Creek um, and the possibility of uh, about 220 trees being removed. I realize that um, the commission has been looking into that issue and um, I was a part of the uh, subcommittee that went to one of the meetings um, in 2017. Um, and at that time, I believe we put the San Francisco Creek as one of the two, on the two year plan. Now, I know that um, it may not be uh, written on there as it is right now, but I just want to say that uh, uh, there's a lot of public interest on what's going on there. Um, the uh, JPA, uh, Joint Powers Authority has been presenting um, their plans for what's going on at the Chaucer, Pope Chaucer Bridge. And um, they've been working a little bit with the residents in that uh, some of the residents pointed out there's some very large heritage trees in the area. Would there be a way for them to adjust their plans? And so they have done a little bit of that um, adjustment. I just want to say as a former commissioner and as a resident of the area uh, that I hope that the EQC continues to keep the uh, Pope Chaucer Bridge project and the trees that are going that tentatively could be removed as part of their plan. Um, if they all got removed, obviously it would change the uh, feel of the neighborhood um, to build to make the project work. Some trees are going to have to come out, but basically, I just want to uh, share with you that many people in the community are aware of what's going on, and I know that you guys have been looking into it. So that's my public comment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Um, the next speaker will be, um, again, the, the phone number ending in 2856. I have unmuted you. You may need to unmute yourself by pushing star nine, or I'm not quite sure what would work. Let me try to find out. Again, this is public comment for phone number ending in 2856. I'm sorry, Chair Price. I think that they may be having a bit of an issue trying mm -hmm. to unmute. Why don't we, um, why don't we, move forward but if the person is able to email and or oh here oh there it goes okay. yeah can you hear me now yes now yes. i can thank you yeah sorry this is my first time doing this i'm steve van pelt uh, a resident of suburban park and uh, i'm afraid comments overlapped and i didn't get the comment about unmuting and stuff and, but i've succeeded in doing that I just wanted to make some comments because I recently removed uh, two heritage trees from my backyard. And uh, really I'd attended many of the meetings uh, with concerns about how to do this properly and everything else. Uh, but realize residents of uh, a suburban park here, our lots are among the narrowest in the city uh, the width of about 40 feet. I removed one Monterey pine, which was about a hundred feet tall and 50 feet wide and just love to grow at the transformer at the corner of my property. And I guess what I'd say is, I'm really sorry that I wasn't encouraged to remove this about 20 years ago. Uh, there are significant problems with uh, the root system growing not through, not just in my yard, but, but the neighbors as well. So uh, there was a lot of talk in there about the uh, the lush canopy and everything else. And for people that live on a golf course or an estate, that's fine. But there's a lot of reality uh, with what's under the ground. The other tree uh, was a blackwood acacia, which is uh, called an invasive species. And I'm only now finding out what invasive species means. Uh, because even though the tree is gone, the stump has been ground down. Uh, the roots can regenerate themselves and are starting to pop up uh, all over the backyard and things. Uh, and again, this is something that I wish uh, 
I had attacked uh, when I when I first moved in and things. So there there needs to be a better balance in in presenting all this. Not everything is just positive and uh, let your tree grow bigger. There there are some negative things as well. Uh, that that's really all I have to say. Do you have questions for me? Thank you. We um, we appreciate it. We're um, part of at the beginning of the meeting. We talk about how the EQC unfortunately is not able. Commissioners are not able to speak to items that aren't listed on the agenda, which includes the specifics regarding a public comment. So, um, other than to thank you for your comment or to provide general guidance, which I don't believe we would have um, for your comments. Um, we, we can't um, ask you questions, but we appreciate you sharing your experience. I think that it's really important for people to share their experience with the heritage tree process. Ms. Lucky, are there any additional public comments? No, not at this time. Thank you. Um, therefore, we will conclude public comment and we will transition to the regular business. Under regular business, the EQC considers providing advice to city council on sustainability policy matters or administrative actions that require a city council decision. Um, so the first item under regular business is, and I'm sorry about that noise, it's my dog, he's coughing, he's fine. Um, he has bronchitis. Um, so we need to approve the minutes from the January 20th meeting and the February 25th meeting. Um, so I've introduced that item. Um, did anybody have any clarifying questions regarding the minutes before we take public comment on the minutes? No, oh, but I have a request and I don't even know if this is possible in an admission, which is that in preparation for giving the slide deck tonight, I did not get a chance to review the minutes. Would it be possible to delay uh, approval of the minutes uh, till our next meeting, Ms. Lucky? Uh, that's really up to the, the commission. Okay, all right. I guess I'd like to request that, but obviously I'm only one vote, so. Does anybody have a concern or how, how do people feel about, well, it's, we can discuss this under discussion, but first we should take public comment because it's not a clarifying question. So does anybody have any other clarifying questions before we move to the discussion? I mean, public comment, excuse me. No, okay. Um, Ms. Lucky, are there any public comments on this item at this time? Thank you, Chair Price. So at this time, if there are any members of the public who are in attendance and wish to provide public comment, um, you can engage the raised hand feature next to your name in the participants list. I'll have the ability to open your microphone and you can provide your public comment to the EQC on this agenda item. And for those who are calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine so that we will be able to see that your hand is raised. And with that, I do not see any hands raised for public comment on this item. Thank you. Um, so returning the meeting to a discussion this time by the EQC, we, going back to Josie's question, um, do we, does anybody, what are people's thoughts on delaying the decision um, to give each commissioner an opportunity to review the minutes? Uh, Deb. Well, I have a suggestion. Since the minutes are really not that um, long, we could, re we could review them now. We could bring them up and, and have a look and spend, you know, five or so minutes looking at them now um, as one possibility. That works for me. I don't know what others think. Yes, Tom. It, it works for me also. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Other than the attached presentations to the minutes, the minutes themselves are actually quite short, so we can go through them pretty quickly. Josie, does that help answer your question? Yeah, I think I wanted to make sure that the work plan edits like uh, looked right to me, but it's, uh, and I don't think we're going to go through that. So, uh, but uh, I, I think I'm okay if, if the minutes are short and if the work plan is, you know, whatever I sent um, over to Rebecca at some point, um, I guess I'm okay with that. 
I think it's a Josie's point is a good one though because she's the closest to the work plan and so if that's your question then I I do wonder if it makes sense to wait if if we're when we're approving the minutes if we're also approving 100% the attachments that are included that makes sense to me then I don't know if that changes anyone else's point of view I just know there were many drafts of it and I can understand yeah. wanting to take time to make sure it's the same draft that is, it's supposed to be. Yeah, and I really apologize that I didn't do this before the meeting. Um, partly it slipped my mind and then I was scrambling on the slide. So if you all don't mind, I will go through and just make sure that you know what got attached was the final draft and it incorporated all the, the edits that we all made as a group. And I, we spent a lot of time on, so I wanna make sure that they're all incorporated correctly. And Deb, your hand is Yeah, up. I think it's fine. I just, full disclosure, I mean, a month from now, I, I just, <laughs> I like to review them when they're still fresh in my mind because I have a tendency to, when, when time goes by, then I forget the substance of it and, you know, I might not pick up on it. So, I mean, it's fine. That's the only thing I would say. I know for me personally, the longer it goes, I can't really, I, I, my ability to review the minutes and comment gets a little bit diminished, but um, if is there, you want it done, then we would be reviewing three sets of minutes then at the next meeting, yeah. right? So and we need to save some extra time for that, I think. So one, one question I had is, is it possible for us to review, to approve the minutes, but uh, allow to ensure that the work plan is the correct draft and to give if it's not, then we can bring it back, but we could approve it assuming that it is and there's no issue with it. And then Josie can give a look to it. And if she sees anything different, we can bring it back next month. Would that work for everybody? That works for okay. me. Um, the other thing is, Deb, if there were, because you were feeling like you, if there were things that were fresh to bring up, um, you know, if, if you felt like there were things that you wanted to bring up, like I would encourage you to maybe bring it up now for discussion. No, I just, I, I could go either way on this. Let's not make it a big, whatever you guys want to do is okay. fine. I just, I, I tend to forget things. So if I'm reviewing them and asked to approve them, you know, I, I just know that I'm not as good. I'm not as fresh with that. But if it's I, just, maybe it's just my issue. So let's no, not no, worry no. about it. Whatever you guys want to do is fine with I don't think it's your issue. If I didn't have my chair notes that I keep, I don't think I would be able to do it either. So I totally understand. Um, why don't we look at the minutes and, um, uh, you know, if we approve them, we can look at them and approve them pending any, and if then Josie has any concerns, we can always bring it back. Um, so let's do that. Um, does everybody feel comfortable with that? Yes. Yep. Okay. So are there any other discussion elements does anybody want to walk through the document or are we if we reviewed it ahead of time are we comfortable um with any motions uh, maybe we could just pull them up real quick is sure. that a possibility yeah i don't have that power but rebecca does Sorry, I'm having a, I've got two screens open, so it's. We can tell you when we see it. <laughs> oh, here it is. I got it. There. Can you see it? Yep. Now we can see it. Thank you. So we're starting with the January minutes. And you're looking at the work plan, right? So that would be D2. And the action is highlighted here. Yep. Okay, and would you like to see the, the work plan or the next item? Just let me know and I'll, I can scroll for you. 
I'm comfortable. Probably not the I, work plan. I think probably not the work plan because that would be rather detailed. I think what we're saying is um, unless Josie sees something in there that um, or or any of us, um, we can get back to you and, and let you know. But otherwise, if, the, if this sort of minutes at the surface here looks okay, then I think that's what we're trying to maybe approve, right? I would agree with that. Yeah. And I reviewed it ahead of time, so I'm all good. Did you want to see the February minutes? I mean, these minutes to me look look like they reflect what I recall. recall. Um, so Same. I don't really have an issue with these, this particular one, if anyone else does. So do we do we vote on them independently or as a collective? Re Rebecca, do you know? You could do it as a collective, okay. um, unless um, Commissioner Gillard wants to review these in particular further, and then I could bring back the January minutes for next month. These are the January ones, right? Yes. Let's, we can do them together. That's fine. Okay. Um, does anybody, do we want to look at the February minutes or if we were able to look at them ahead of time, are we comfortable making a motion? To answer Rebecca's question, should she pull up the February minutes? Um, I looked at the February minutes ahead of time and didn't notice anything. I was absent for the January meeting, so I can't comment on the accuracy of those. But, um, but yeah, the February minutes looked good to me. Yeah, and same with me. I didn't. I looked at the February meetings and not this month, so I, I didn't have an issue with them either. Yeah, the. They, they look short to me. They're about one page. I think it was about page 34 of this deck. So I would go ahead. Do you want, did you want, Tom, are you suggesting that um, Rebecca bring them up or? Yeah, I'm, I'm suggesting that, that um, we we quickly zoom down to page 34, about two thirds of the way through this deck. And we'll, we'll, we'll all be able to see the minutes there. Is it 34, right? Yes, I think so. There you go. That might make your eyes go crazy. <laughs> Let me scroll the link. <laughs> I, oh, I just noticed one thing, actually. I don't know that I introduced the minutes. I thought that Janelle did because I was late. I think uh, I didn't yes. arrive until the next item. So that should say Vice Chair uh, London instead of. Ending that edit, everything was good from my point of view. Yep. Do you want me to make a motion to approve the minutes then? Sure. Okay, I'm making a motion to approve the January and February meeting minutes. And I would second that motion. And do, do we want to include in the motion that it's that uh, we'll be allowed to revisit the work plan? Oh yeah, pending any, um, can we say something like we approve the minutes pending um, any revisions to the work plan that might, like in other words, if that needs to get, if, a, if the correct version needs to get added, that that could be done with this approval. However we want to say that, is that kind of what we're getting at? Yes. Yeah. How do we say that? <laughs> Maybe it's approving the minutes uh, pending verification, the right draft of the work plan is included. Okay. 
Okay, with that, we could do roll call. Um, so, Commissioner Price? Uh, aye. Commissioner Elkins? Aye. Commissioner Martin? Yes, you said. <laughs> I said I, I said I. Did you hear me? You did. No, okay. <laughs> I, I missed it. Sorry. Oh, um, I. <laughs> okay. Thank you, um, Commissioner Gellard. Aye. Commissioner Cabot. Aye. Okay. Motion passes. Oh, I didn't vote, but I. As well. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see the screen. <laughs> That's what happens when you share a screen. I'm so sorry, Commissioner Payne. Okay. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we can return to our agenda and look at the uh, item D2. So this is, um, item D2 is an informal presentation by Commissioners Gaylord and Cabot on the affordability of building electrification. Um, so we're gonna invite, I believe Rebecca is gonna be controlling the slides, but Tom and Josie are gonna be giving the presentation. Um, and after they give the presentation or during, people can ask clarifying questions, but just please remember that we can't um, ask, we can't have discussions until after we take public comment. Great. Um, so Rebecca, unless you need to introduce anything, should I get started? Should sure. we get started? Okay. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen. If you all will let me know when you can see it. We see it now. Okay, great. So um, thank you for giving us a little bit of time to bring this, uh, all this research to you. Tom and I have been working on uh, this a model looking at the affordability of building electrification in Menlo Park for I don't know the last three months or so, um, and we built a big model in Excel and um, done a lot of research in terms of the technical issues. Um, I'm electrifying my house. Tom has already electrified his most of his house, um, so we're and we're doing a lot of sort of networking with different um, folks involved in this space to become as knowledgeable as we can and happy to share this with you today uh, so that you all feel informed as we start to, as the city starts to think about um, policy around electrification of buildings. You know, we've affectionately called it a burnout ordinance, um, although that, that may change that terminology, but okay. So this picture is, uh, gives you an idea of the appliances we're talking about, and we'll, we'll come back to it. Just a reminder, this is all coming out of our climate action plan with our goal of 90% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2030. And it's a part of CAP action number one specifically, which is to explore a policy or program options to convert 95% of existing buildings in Menlo Park to all electric by 2030. It's an ambitious goal. And, um, you know, it, we, in order to try to meet it, we, it's, uh, we can't delay. So a reminder, our greenhouse gas emissions profile for Menlo Park uh, is represented here in a pie chart. It shows over 50% of our, at least in 2017, which is when this data is from, 56% uh, of the greenhouse gas emissions in the city came from vehicles and 34% came from natural gas. Electrifying buildings actually uh, directly addresses the yellow natural gas, 34%. And then indirectly um, helps support the um, electrification of vehicles by providing charging uh, in buildings. So the key elements of an electrification policy, whether it's a burnout ordinance or what it might whatever it might be. There's sort of five basic components as I'm thinking about it, Tom and I have been thinking about it. There's the legal pieces, you know, what's, possi what's possible um, from a legal perspective and enforceable and, and um, sort of uh, defensible. There's the technical aspects of it. 
what can be done, what technology exists to address the issue of building electrification, how developed is the market, both the equipment market and the installation market, how enforceable would a policy be? Um, right now in Menlo Park, permit compliance, especially for water heaters, is quite low. So um, are there mechanisms for enforcing whatever policy might be put in place? And then finally, and this is the focus of this presentation, um, you know, if an if a ordinance or a mandate were passed, um, what's the affordability picture? Is this placing any undue burden on residents of the city or, or not? So some of the basic questions that we looked at were, um, what does it cost to fully electrify an existing single family home? I say San Mateo County, but specifically we're really focused on Menlo Park. Um, can we make the transition costs affordable enough to pass a city ordinance? So one could argue that at least um, for most of Menlo Park's population, we may not have to make the, um, the electrification route uh, exactly equal in cost to, you know, the, the standard uh, natural gas appliance route. Uh, but it has to be affordable enough so that a city ordinance could be passed without, um, you know, without residents feeling burdened. Um, number three, what levers and policymakers uh, and utilities, what do they have to help achieving affordability? And are there any pieces of this puzzle that are that are missing that we really need to work and put in place? Um, what partnerships might be needed with you know third party financing provided to to residents or um, maybe on bill financing provided through the the CCE Peninsula Clean Energy? So what partnerships might might be necessary? And then what can we learn from the development of rooftop solar uh, market and, and any other industries that might have um, analogies. Rooftop solar is relevant because it, you know, requires a truck roll to someone's home and it's selling them something that can be a high capital cost, but um, with financing can be amortized over say a 20 year period and becomes um, with financing becomes affordable really for, for, for anyone um, since it reduces your utility bill so much. So there are a lot of ana uh, analogies there. Okay. So here's back to the um, picture with the um, little icons showing the different devices we're talking about. Uh, the ones labeled one through five are the key um, devices that in most people's, in many people's homes today run on natural gas. So your furnace, a dryer, um, your range or cooking range in your kitchen. Number four, your water heater. And number five, your car doesn't run on natural gas, but it runs on gasoline for most people. So all of these can be converted to um, electric versions. Uh, in many cases, so we took a look at rooftop solar. The reason is that it makes, it doesn't help with making the project any more green or reducing the greenhouse gas emissions of the project because our energy in, in San Mateo County is already 100% uh, carbon free through Peninsula Clean Energy. So solar doesn't help make this project more green, it makes it more affordable because right now solar is um, so much cheaper than grid electricity. Um, and then finally, to answer the question or the pushback that we get sometimes when we talk about um, electrifying buildings, that what happens when the power goes out, we wanted to look at what does it cost to add a battery backup system to make these all electric homes more reliable during power outages. All right, Tom, do you want to take it over? Clarifying sure. question. Can I ask? Sure. Yes. So one of the questions I have is, so you talk about the battery backup systems. I know one of the questions we've gotten a number of times from people in the community is that that all electric wouldn't be as reliable. And I guess my question is, what how did you discover what appliances you can use during a power outage that are gas that you couldn't use if they were electric? It's a good question. Um, there aren't many. Um, so most 
for example, a gas furnace, um, most gas furnaces that would go in someone's garage, like not a wall furnace, but something, you know, that, that pushes air through ducts in your house, those have electric blowers on them. So that would not work in a power outage. Um, new gas water heaters actually have uh, electric, I believe, igniters. And so they, they have parts that um, require uh, electricity. So that also would not work. Um, so a, a, an electric dryer would not work. <laughs> so there's really the cooktop, which uh, would in many cases, you know, even if it has an electric igniter, you could just throw a match and um, you know, light a burner. So that is one device that works in a power outage today um, that if you got an electric version, wouldn't necessarily work without a battery. But if you had a battery, you, you could continue to cook um, even through a power outage. Yep. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yep. thank you. I think some of the things people focus on using their battery for are some lighting circuits and keeping their certain appliances charged like their phones and computers and running their refrigerator. And so those types of small loads are easy to power with a battery. And so that also then allows folks to do some countertop cooking uh, as well. Instant pots are good for, <laughs> uh, for power outages. So, um, okay. Ryan, if that answers your question, we'll move on. Oh, actually, I think there's a couple questions. Okay, I can't see anything, so <laughs> please just jump in. Ryan, are you able to see our, because Leah and I have our raised hand. I can see you, Deb, but I can't see Leah. I only have four squares. Okay, um, okay. so. So, yeah, I yeah, know it's kind of, it's always hard with these presentations, I know. So, you no, know, just a quick question, and then maybe we can take Leah's question is um, the battery um, backup, what's the typical length of, like, if your power goes out, how long is that battery backup typically good for? Yeah, it depends. It's a good question. It depends on how, uh, how big a battery you get. So, they come in different sizes. And um, the one we mod, you can get them so that you can run uh, your house. For example, if you had solar, that you could just um, have the solar fill up the battery during the day and run your whole house all night and um, do that indefinitely, right? Like for 30 days, I've seen people on. YouTube showing how with two power walls or three power walls, I can't remember, but they were able to go like 30 days without using any grid power. So that's possible. Um, what we modeled was a little more like an economic scenario, which is a 13.5 kilowatt hour battery, which um, as Tom said, it wouldn't power your whole home, you know, every, um, every use in your home for, for very long, but you, you could um, get by with like your bat, your refrigerator and some um, lights and, you know, the instant pot in the kitchen and that type of thing. So some basics, that's what we modeled. So that's what you'll be seeing. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Yep. Anyone else have a question? Just jump in. Yeah, I do. Um, okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so going back to what you said about the, the grid and PCE, you said that um, all of our energy is in San Mateo County is clean um, because of PCE, but I'm not clear about that. Um, can, you, can you explain that to me? Because not everybody uses PCE. Yeah, so that is true. It's a very small percentage though. I want to say it's like three, only 3% 3 of, of San Mateo County opted out of Peninsula Clean Energy. When it was created in 2017, everyone in the county was defaulted into it. So um, now people have since some, but a very small percentage have decided to opt out of it, which means they have to like call and say, I don't wanna do this. And then they get switched back over to um, PG&E as their energy generation provider. Everyone has PG&E bills. Right. Um, that provide and PG&E still provides the wires and the distributing the electricity, but the generation, um, I think it's only 3% or so of people in San Mateo County who, uh, who have opted out of PCE. Okay. But okay. you're right for, for those customers, um, you know, 
just just to note, PG and E. I was just learning this yesterday, actually. PG and E um, for 2019 and or 20, you know, is claiming that their electricity they provided was actually 100% carbon free. Huh. Okay. Um, uh, but my other question is, there are two tiers to PCE as well. Yes. Uh, so everybody has opted into, by default, the first tier, which is less than 100%. Isn't that correct? No, it's, it's, there's a distinction between um, being carbon free and being renewable. So the, the basic tier is now 100% carbon free, but not 100% renewable. It includes large hydro. Okay. Um, and then the top tier where you pay a little bit more, that is 100% renewable. So it's wind and solar, I think, primarily. Yes, but Commissioner Elkins, you're right. Um, when PCE first formed, that base product was only 80% carbon free. Okay. And it, is, it has since moved to 100% carbon free. Just uh, starting, I believe it was January this year, it became 100%. In the first tier, more yeah, that first the tier. The, the the upper tier had always been carbon free, and it had more renewables. And the state of California makes a distinction between those things. One thing that is carbon free, but uh, not deemed by California to be renewable, is large hydroelectric plants larger than thirty megawatts. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, hearing none, I will continue. And just again, because I can't see anybody, please just jump in. Tom, do you wanna um, take this one? Sure, sure. This, this plot on the left axis, you can see it's tons of, of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. And so it's the, the home's um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions from energy, including gasoline uh, before the project, you know, before this, um, conversion and then afterwards. And that little bit of emissions afterwards is really related to the um, transmission of electricity, which is uh, still happens with, uh, without being renewable in all cases. So what, but what you can see is all the different carbon emissions that got reduced, that big green one from the car, then the next one below it is blue from the furnace, the uh, heating, ventilation and air conditioning system. And then the yellow one is the water heater. Um, and then the, a range and a clothes dryer and uh, finishing off with plugs and lights. And next. Yeah, uh, actually, I wanna jump in with one mm -hmm. other thing. Um, just a good frame of reference. So in Menlo Park from this plot, you can see that this typical home uses, you know, eight and a half um, or so tons of CO2 per year, or sorry, emits um, eight and a half tons of CO2 per year. Um, Typical for the United States is 20 per, per capita is 20 uh, tons of CO2 per. So if you want to just have in your mind that typical for the US is about 20. Northern California, we just we emit a lot less because we have this mild climate and we have had this really stringent energy efficiency code in our buildings for so long. So we, we emit about half of the um, American average now. The world average is much lower in Europe. I want to say it's like six tons per year and per capita. And um, India, for reference, is under one ton per year per capita. So, sorry, Tom. Could you just clarify why are there greenhouse gas emissions associated with transmission of uh, completely renewable electricity? Yes, it's um, a function of the renewable portfolio standard legislation. And it says that the, uh, you, the energy provider will match the volume of sales with a volume of purchases from renewable power, a one for one match. And there are about 7% transmission and distribution losses between the generator and the customer. And so if the customer is using 100 units of energy, the utility needs to procure 107 from generators and about 7% is lost in transmission. And they, so those amounts are covered currently by the California Independent System Operator. And so the, 
PCE is not buying the 7% on their own. They're not hunting for it. They're just leaving it up to the California ISO as everyone does to procure it. And the CAISO, California ISO, uh, probably is not procuring renewables for it. They're, they're just taking, or they're buying whatever they can get at the time. Thank you. All right, and uh, next slide. Do you see what does it cost to electrify, Tom? Yes, it's up okay. now. Thanks. Yes. Um, so, so in this one on the graph on the left, uh, it's going to be the same as the table on the right. Uh, the leftmost bar shows the annual energy costs for the home, appliances being replaced as needed. You know, so as each one burns out, they get replaced. But this is the kind of the endpoint condition. If you had stayed you know, business as usual, pre-electrification on the left side. That gray piece at the top is the gasoline for the car. The orange part of the bar is natural gas, methane for the water heater, space heat, cooking, drying. And the, the uh, blue part down below is the electricity bill for uh, plugs and lights, things like that. The second bar over uh, is after electrifying everything, uh, the car and the uh, natural gas appliances, but using just grid electricity, you know, not installing solar or a battery. And so in that case, what you see is the overall energy cost for the household is still the same, but now it's um, mostly electric bill and that yellow part is some uh, loan payments. So the, the conversion cost um, cost about, uh, you'll see it on the next slide, a little over $9,000. Um, incremental cost. And so that was financed at 5% over 20 years, resulting in a, an annual loan payment up there. Uh, looks like a little over a thousand dollars. And then in the next uh, bar over, you see now the total costs are reduced and that was by adding a solar system to the roof. And so what you see is the blue electric bill went way down, cut uh, down to a slightly less than half and the amount of loan payments increased because the solar system was financed at 20 years at a 5% interest rate in this assumption. And then the far right bar is just more progress down that path with adding that uh, 13 and a half kilowatt hour home battery for resilience and um, bill savings. You can see it was able to cut the bill further by storing up uh, solar energy during the day when rates are low and then uh, discharging that solar energy back to the house in the early evening hours when rates are at their highest. And so you, you can see again, the, the blue utility bill went down and the amount of uh, loan payments went up, but the cost is about the same. And so this, you can see the difference between those final two bars is really getting this resilience piece without having an increase in the bill. And next. All right, so the, you know, all this analysis was done on an example home, very typical here in Menlo Park. Uh, it, this can be redone for different types of homes, but this one was, was a common one, mid-century, say 1950s home with regular energy efficiency upgrades, had some attic insulation and duct insulation had already been done uh, prior to, to uh, the electrification project. It's a mid-size home, about 1,500 square feet with a mid-size electric panel, 100 amp panel. That's kind of the smaller size we see around here, although some of the really old ones are 60 amps. And then the assumption was the homeowner has good credit and can borrow at 5% interest rate. And so then this table is showing kind of where the, which uh, all the appliances listed down the left side and then the starting state and ending state for each device. So you can see the water heating went from a gas water heater to a heat pump water heater and it converted in the third year. That's what's showing in the right column. These are just different estimated times for when things burnt out in this hypothetical situation or when the, the uh, customer was motivated to make the change, like getting solar in the first year, you can see down low on the table and uh, switching to an electric vehicle early on. Both of those can save a lot of money. So people tend to uh, wanna do those early. But we, we basically looked at 
changing each of the fossil fired devices over to an electric version. And adding, uh, you can see for solar, adding 5.8 kilowatts of solar, which is the largest size array that fits easily onto a 100 amp panel and adding that 13 kilowatt hour battery, but keeping the same electric service of up 100 amps. Uh, this is an example uh, diagram um, uh, produced by a, a local volunteer artist, Courtney Bayer. She worked with Josie and I to produce this diagram that shows what we're talking about for, for just being careful in selecting the appliances and the strategy for how to electrify so that you don't have to upsize the electric panel. And this example is showing an electric panel, say for a, a slightly larger home, 2000 square feet and just showing that the choices made and the new green uh, circuits added down below, though, including a solar circuit on the lower left side and a 15 amp heat pump water heater on the lower right side. But the way the electric code counts everything up, it was able to stay within the 100 amp limit. And so it could still fit on the old panel. And this helps avoid about a $3,000 cost of, of upsizing electric panels. And, and next. Um, and both these diagrams are in a new guidebook that just came out a 90 page guide on how to electrify homes. But uh, this one is showing how to do the same amp diet on an even bigger home up to 3000 square feet. And on the lower right, you can see it's using um, uh, uh, two things we call automatic circuit sharing. And these are new devices made by um, a Central California firm and Silicon Valley firms that uh, let two devices share the same circuit. And the, the uh, device in between is kind of a little air traffic controller between the two. And whenever the priority device in the upper one, it's the, the clothes dryer. When the clothes dryer wants energy, it gets it. And the water heater waits to finish recharging the hot water tank. And then when the clothes are finished, the water heater gets the energy. And then the bottom one, it was the range getting it first for cooking and then the uh, car charging later, which works out fine. Most people, when they get their electric vehicles, they start charging them after midnight. And next. Oh, here's a the picture and a, a web link to that new guide, 90 pages of, um, really interesting information. And it was all sponsored by local organization, Menlo Spark. So I'm really proud of that group for stepping up and sponsoring a series of guides that help people learn to electrify. All right, and then this table goes over the capital cost assumptions in the, for this analysis. And so in the green box is the um, electrical equipment installation so what was happening for electrification in the kind of orangish boxes to the right, that's the equivalent gas equipment that was avoided. And then the yellow cells show all the input cells to the model that the user can change easily. And so their costs, capital costs, mostly uh, Josie was getting a lot of these through some of her own shopping. And so filling them in with real bids. And so what we show to the far right is the difference where some electric equipment costs more than some gas equipment. And so we call it a premium. So the difference uh, electric equipment installed cost minus gas equipment installed cost is that premium. And the, the whole adventure uh, after incentives would be in this analysis about $9,300. Um, if you, if you weren't replacing any of your gas devices, but you just decided to throw them out, even though they were only a month old and, and just get new ones anyway, and you incur the full cost of electrification without any credit for saving on the gas appliance, it would be about $18,000, a little over 18,000. Included in there are things like the permit costs and uh, that one of the differences is this transition cost of putting in the new wiring and it, uh, that type of thing. And I'll just jump in here. You know, when we, we presented this earlier today to somebody who was saying, you know, $9,000, it seems like a lot and it does. But remember that, especially if someone does this upon burnout of their devices, they may be spending that $9,000 premium over like a 10 year period. So that, you know, when you're thinking about doing everything at once, it seems perhaps like a big number, but, um, 
you can either do it kind of gradually over time or you could finance it and then again amortize that large upfront capital cost over a 10, 15, 20 year period. All right. So can I just ask on the last slide quickly, um, why did the electric permit cost specify fee and labor of permits separate from the labor cost of the electric equipment installation itself? Yeah, so um, this arises, uh, I, I think I understand your question and I'm, I'm gonna give you an answer and tell me if it answers it. So um, a lot of the contractors will quote you something without permits and because, you know, I like to get permits and because I was doing this as a part of, you know, learning about what, what others in the city would have to do, I wanted to go through the permit process. So I had them all quote me um, the project with permits and a lot of them actually put it in as a line item and they say, this does not include the permit fees. This is just like a thousand dollars in many cases, like for the electric work that I uh, was looking at, um, they would quote about a thousand dollars to just apply for the permits and go through the city's uh, process and stand for inspection. So that's separate from then the fees, um, which I did a $2,000, um, wiring project and there were $550 worth of permit fees. So that's separate from like the installer's time to apply for the permits and stand for the inspection. Does that answer the question? Yeah, that is what I was asking. I just didn't realize yeah, that installers would charge uh, additional labor costs associated with the labor of acquiring the permits. Yes, it's a significant burden to them. In some cases it can add like 25% to the cost of the project. Is it, sorry, I have a clarifying question. Is that true regardless of the city or are, is, is, are certain cities more burdensome than others? Certain cities are more burdensome than others. And um, they tell, what I've been told by at least two contractors is that they, I said, wow, that thousand dollars, that's a lot. And they say, yeah, we just take the city that's the most difficult and we just charge the same everywhere. Um, so, cause they don't like, to, I guess they don't like to try to keep in their mind, like which city has a difficult process and which doesn't. And all the cities have different processes and they're all changing all the time. So, you know, one of the things Tom and I have been thinking about, is there a way to have, to recommend like a more streamlined process and something that could be easily adopted, like a, a really simplified process that could be easy, easily adopted by many cities um, to kind of both streamline and um, make more universal one process. Okay. Tom, you wanna walk people through sure. this? Sure, so this, this one goes over the, the numbers and statistics on the solar economics. And so we're, we're using that larger solar system of 5.8 kilowatts and uh, using a solar system cost that's available now $2 per watt before tax credits. Uh, and that makes the total system cost around $11,000. There still is a 26% federal tax credit. All of the state incentives are gone now, but the federal tax credit takes 26% off the, the cost of the system after you get that credit back. So it's about $8,500 and then uh, these next several rows are talking about what is the production of it, and it's producing around 9,200 kilowatt hours a year, lasting 25 years. Uh, and so we also take into account uh, derating factor for age. You know, as the panels age, they produce a little less, and they because they get dirty and other issues. Also, uh, because we we had a little slight derating or clipping um, uh, loss of seven percent there, and. Uh, anyway, that makes 6,900 kilowatt hours per year of usable power. And so if we look at that and divide the, uh, all the costs of the system after tax credit by all the production over its life, it's around five cents per kilowatt hour. And so that's significantly cheaper than the grid price for electricity, now around uh, 23 cents a kilowatt hour. And so this is why uh, solar is pretty attractive in our area for people who keep up with with this. 
uh, its solar used to be expensive and a lot of people remember it that way, but that's no longer the case. It has become the more affordable energy for your home. And then uh, the bottom part of the sheet is looking at if you were to finance that at the 20 year loan borrowed at 5% interest, it would change the cost from roughly five cents a kilowatt hour if you paid cash to 10 cents a kilowatt hour because of financing it, just the, the, that the uh, loan interest uh, essentially doubles the cost. And next. Do you want me to jump in here, Tom? Sure. Okay. Um, so financing and other key assumptions here. I, we've mentioned this several times, but there was a, uh, we assumed a 20 year loan with a 5% fixed interest rate. Um, the electrification costs that we showed there reflect actual bids and quotes that I got from four or five star installers, um, four or five stars on Yelp. So, um, or it was a like a national company like Tesla that just offers a flat price, um, like the $2 a watt for solar. So um, we assumed that the battery would be able to cycle as Tom mentioned, meaning store up energy during the day and then, um, you know, feed the house at night so you could avoid the really high energy cost during a peak period. So 65% of the battery could be used for that, that sort of flexing every day. Um, and then 35% would be reserved in case there was like a power outage that night, you would still have something in the battery. And the more likely case of power outages around here recently has been, we get some notice. Like, um, Actually, my car tells me you know, th there might be a power outage. You might want to fill up your fill up your battery. So with the PSPS events and the um, you know the summer heat wave uh, outages, we got notice. So that would be a time when you could actually fill that battery all the way up to the you know 100 percent, um, and then be able to use it to try to uh, get through one of the outages. So we assume that 26 percent federal tax credit. Uh, Peninsula Clean Energy currently has offers a combined rebate um, of a total of $2,500 for heat pump water heaters. So we assumed that um, the best electric rate uh, for the end state case is a PG&E rate called the EV2A rate, which if you buy an EV or get a battery system installed, you can use this rate. And it has a really high difference. It has a very cheap um, cost of electricity, 17 cents a kilowatt hour for most of the day. And just um, has a really high rate during the peak hours, which is 4 p.m. to 9 p.m., 48 cents a kilowatt hour. So um, we used a recent study just released in February from the CPUC about um, where they were projecting out what rate increases will be for electricity, natural gas, and then they wanted to compare it to gasoline since EVs are becoming such a major part of their, their planning. So we used the numbers um, that they provided, the CPUC provided, and it basically shows natural gas increasing, natural gas and gasoline prices increasing up almost double the rate, um, the escalation per year uh, for, uh, versus electricity. So we assume 12,000 vehicle miles uh, per year and just some basic assumptions about how many loads of laundry and how much cooking someone did. Okay, so this is the same slide that Tom showed. It's just kind of, I wanted to recap sort of the point was uh, pre-electrification and post-electrification. If you do financing, you, you know, your annual expense, this is averaged over a 20 year period, the annual expense is um, the same. If you add solar in, you save a significant amount of money and you can add the battery in for, uh, for basically free. All right, so this is um, this is a graph that shows the cash flows. So this was sort of a single point look, just an average over the 20 year period. This is a cash flow anal analysis over a 30 year period. So what do we see? We see with the blue swooping line up and to the right, that is a mixed fuel home. So a home that has gas appliances and keeps those gas appliances. Uh, assuming all those rates that the PUC is projecting, those rate increases, um, this is what the person would pay on an, on an annual basis for, to operate their home for their energy. Uh, and that includes the gasoline too, for the car, 12,000 miles a year. So the, 
orange, gray, and yellow lines then show what happens if you electrify the home in different scenarios. Orange is just you electrify, including an EV charger, but you don't have any solar or battery. Um, gray is you add in a battery. So that would be a situation where someone maybe doesn't have roof a roof that's suitable for solar. So they add in a battery. Um, you know, it's no more than the, the orange line. In fact, it's a little bit less, and, uh, especially in those outer years. And they get that resiliency. So that's a positive. And then the best scenario where this person saves really a lot of money is if they do fully electrify the house, do solar and a battery. So as you can see, you know, my, what I was interested in knowing was if we passed an ordinance for, for burnout, you know, would we be burdening people financially? And as you can see, if the person is able to do solar, um, that actually we're saving them a lot of money. So, okay. And then we did have someone ask us a question when we presented this yesterday, another kind of analyst type person say, well, what if the, the federal tax credit goes away? What if the PCE rebate for water heaters were to go away? What if they assume, you know, what if you assume that the solar price isn't Tesla, but it's like a smaller installer that charges more um, 350 a watt instead of $2 a watt. What does that look like? So we put all those numbers in to just see. And you know what we see here is yes, the person's paying just very slightly more than the business as usual case, the blue line. Um, you know, this yellow, yellow and gray lines are a little bit higher in years like uh, six through maybe nine. But then there's this crossover point, and again, the person is saving saving a lot of money um, from about year 14 or 15 on. Okay, so key findings here. One is electrification is, co can, is cost neutral from day one to the customer if it's financed, paired with rooftop solar, if they get competitive um, bids for the work, and um, it, the amount that's financed is this, the premium of the electrification over the gas appliances. So more considering like a, on a burnout um, timeline, uh, as opposed to doing the whole thing at once when maybe the gas furnace is just brand new. Um, we assume, you know, it's really important that people do these AMP diets. So pay attention to the devices that they're putting. And when, you know, there's this problem right now that a lot of electricians are telling people who want to install an EV charger, oh, you just need to upgrade your panel, get in line with PG&E. It could take six months and it's going to cost $3,000, but, you know, you should do it. And we're seeing actually they don't need to do it. Um, they're being sort of upsold, maybe not, you know, not in any nefarious way by the electricians, but um, I think the electricians think they're just being overly ca you know, cautious, but it's really not necessary and it presents a hurdle and a burden to people. So um, educating folks about that, both the customers and the installers. Uh, capital costs for the appliances are currently um, higher than their equivalent gas appliances. That is true. Um, but then solar is so inexpensive now that, it, again, it really um, makes the economics work pencil out really well for the customer. And then adding a battery pays for itself. So there's some lessons we can learn from rooftop solar, which 20 years ago looked very different from what it does today. 20 years ago, if someone had to write a check for Twenty or thirty thousand dollars to get solar, and then banks jumped in and offered third-party financing, and suddenly, with financing, that capital cost could get amortized over time, and basically anyone could afford solar. Anyone who had decent credit could afford solar. So that's really changed um, with financing. You know, volume changes uh, brings costs down. Uh, training has improved over time. Streamlining permits, also that was done in solar where a lot of um, people were finding that the cities were taking a long time and it was uh, the, the fees were really high. So the state actually stepped in and um, recommended streamlining. So we, we sort of have something that we can look to there. And then um, in solar, there were these step down rebates that, uh, that were stepped down with volume. So it was a certain number of megawatts were sold, then the, then the rebate would ratchet down by a certain percentage. And what that does is it creates demand. So everyone wants to rush to try to get the higher rebate before it goes down. Uh, it, it sort of injects urgency. 
And it also imp imposes a certain discipline on the installer market so that the installers know, well, over a 10 year period, this, you know, this fat rebate is going to go away. So I'm going to have to, um, you know, make sure my business is uh, profitable and we've come up the learning curve so we can offer lower prices by the time the rebate goes away. So it's a nice way to, um, to kind of encourage market development and then not just yank a subsidy away and have a market collapse. And financing, um, again, really key so that this can be something that is not just for you know, wealthy people who have $20,000 in the bank, but for people who um, you know, need to be able to spread out those upfront costs over time. So this is just a slide showing some of these levers, um, low interest financing, on bill financing, we can go through um, these, but, and then who on the right, like who are the policymakers or uh, you know, people who could actually make a difference in that? And one I just wanna call your attention to is the permit streamlining. This is something that the city, you know, it, it really is a hurdle for electrification right now. And it, it's 100% control, 100% under the control of the city. So that's good news because a lot of these things, you know, we need to rely on other people to do. For example, on bill financing, you know, PCE has to do that and work with PG&E on that. Um, so a lot of these things we have to rely on other people, but the streamlining is something that our city could do. Of course, the other thing is the city ordinance, which is what we're talking about um, doing in Menlo Park. Um, other things that, you know, need to, and people are working on all of these, but other things that uh, need to kind of be in place. One is a low interest financing solution um, on bill would be, would be great so that, you know, you just, you know, tell PCE, I want a water heater. Uh, they have, a uh, you know, either they send someone to your house to do it, or they have a list of um, installers to choose from, and then it gets added to your bill and you just pay it over, you know, a 10, you pay it off over a 10 year period, for example. Um, we need more education about AMP diets so that people don't get these um, unnecessary panel upgrades, um, permit streamlining, and then more development of the installer market. So just a few myths that uh, people hear a lot, which is that heat pumps maybe don't work well in the cold. That was true 20 or 30 years ago, but the technology has come up a long way such that you can have a heat pump um, which replaces your gas furnace, you can have a heat pump that works in North Dakota um, just fine. So sub 20 degrees, sub 30 degrees, and, and they are able to work just fine. So that's new. If you hear someone say, oh, a heat pump, it can't work. I mean, in Northern California, I, I actually just installed one. I got my, got rid of my gas furnace. Works really well. Um, it's perfect for this climate, actually. Um, you know, people, people might worry that their, their house would be cold. Uh, other, other things we hear is that, um, you know, the electrical panel could be, you know, everyone needs an electrical panel if they're gonna do electrification, uh, electrical panel upgrade. That is not true. So whenever you hear that, um, <laughs> tell them to call Tom. <laughs> um, electrifying is not just for, for the wealthy, it's, it's really can be made accessible to anyone. And um, the other thing we hear is, well, what about a power outage? But I think we've addressed that. So here's just a table with the potential policy pushback that we've been able to, you know, that we've heard or we wanted to just sort of get down in writing, but, um, but there will be more so we can add, add to the list as we hear them. But one is the cost is too high, but we've talked about all the ways to address that. Um, one is the resiliency risk. We've talked about how to address that with the, the on-site battery system. Uh, another issue we hear is like, why, why us? Like we're just this tiny city, why does it matter? Well, we've seen with Reach Coast how one small city can provide leadership um, for catalyzing change. You know, the latest um, count, I think we, we do this almost at every meeting, but 42 cities and counties now in the state of California have passed a Reach Code. And many of them, like over 50%, it's very similar to Menlo Park's Reach Code, which was the first of its kind. So um, I think Menlo Park can feel really proud of the way that we, um, we set a standard and really catalyze something pretty amazing um, in the state of California. Um, and then the final issue is like, this is too much effort. Like, you know, um, I talked to an installer and five, you get bids from installers and three out, of, three out of the four try to talk me out of it, like that kind of thing. And that is hard, I will tell you. And the permits is hard right now, but um, those things, you know, 
are improving and can be worked out and uh, can be addressed. They are addressable problems. Um, you know, PCE is, is, is looking at different models for, you know, possibly providing some sort of concierge service, you know, help for people doing this, financing, um, educating the public about, you know, just really basic things. Like you don't need a panel upgrade. If someone tries to tell you that, then you don't need it. Um, and then just installer market education and development, helping a lot of the installers have just done, you know, they've installed gas furnaces their whole lives and their whole careers, and that's what they know how to do. So getting them convinced and ready to, to move um, into this new era where everything will be electric. And that is it. Actually, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, maybe I'll keep the slides up in case I, I can't see hands raised if anyone has questions or wants to go back and look at a slide. Otherwise, I'll take my screen sharing off. Are there any clarifying questions before we take public comment? And then after public comment, we would have a discussion. I don't see hands raised, so I'm going to take that as there are no clarifying questions. Um, Ms. Lucky, do we, can we open it up to public comment? Do we have any comments at this time? Yes, thank you, Chair Price. So at this time, if there are any members of the public who wish to speak on this agenda item, please raise your hand, which is a feature you can use next to your name in the participants list. If you're on a phone or a landline or cell phone, you can press star nine to raise your virtual hand and I'll be able to unmute your microphone. And with that, I, I do not see any raised hands at this time. Thank you, Ms. Lucky. So now we can return the meeting to the EQC and um, have a discussion on the presentation. So um, who, does anyone want to start the discussion? I'll start just by saying um, thank you. I think that I really appreciate all the work that you, Josie and Tom have done on this um, and speaking both as a commissioner, but also as somebody who just recently purchased a new home and has to replace a water heater and was talking to Tom about it. Um, it's, it, it is hard and, um, and I really appreciate that you're doing this because it's not just, I know it's gonna make it more approachable for myself, but also for, you know, any, anyone else. And I think that that's really important. Um, if, you know, knowing that we want to address um, climate change and meet our cap goals. So thank you. Um, does anybody else have any areas for discussion or should I keep going? Okay. The, the main question I had was, um, I think you talked about the assumptions around the um, accessibility and the credit. And um, I mean, of the items you highlighted at the end that included, what do you think are, or where might we be able to um, encourage our community to act or to um, offer resources, right? Because just like we see with the EV charging, there's only so far that incentives are gonna be available. Um, so I don't know, I don't know what other ideas or thoughts um, you've uncovered. Tom, I don't know if you have thoughts. I was going to say PCE is, um, this is important to them. And they are looking into, uh, you know, they, they started to offer rebates for the water heater, heat pump water heaters. And included in that is if you do want to do a panel upgrade, there's, I think, $1,500 um, if you're going up to 100 amps and then $750 if you're going up to 200 amp panel. Um, so they're really looking into this. They are, you know, they've uh, worked with uh, this organization called Bayren to pre-screen um, a bunch of water heater installers. So that's available on their lit on their website. So they're starting to kind of um, starting with water heaters, but they're starting to identify and try to smooth the path a bit, I would say, for people, both financially and sort of identifying people who they have pre-vetted and, you know, approved for doing the installation work. Um, but there's more to be done and but they are 
they are working on that. Um, the next piece would be this on bill financing that I mentioned, and they are looking at that. So, um, in terms of like how we can support people, I mean, if we had a page, Palo Alto has, you know, that graphic I showed you is from their website, and they have like 20 pages about building electrification. I mean, that might be a little exaggerated. But they have a lot of information where someone, in, you know, anyone actually could go on their website and learn about what is the heat pump water heater? How does it work? And um, you can on their website, you can click on each of those little icons and then it blows out like a whole bunch more information. So, you know, do we need to recreate that in Menlo Park? Probably not. But, um, you know, if we're serious about this, it would be nice to either promote their resources or have something equivalent um, for our community. Perhaps we would want to work with PCE to make one that's appropriate for PCE territory available to the cities. Um, you know, that might be a route to go. You know, it is early days in trying to figure out how to make it easier on all fronts for people to do this kind of electrification. So we do have a lot of uh, work ahead of us and there are organizations like the Community Choice Energy organizations working on it. Um, and I'm involved in helping develop contractor training with Silicon Valley Clean Energy. And then, uh, you know, there's just a, a lot of efforts going on to try to get different parts of this uh, five legged stool <laughs> to, to keep rising. So, they, you know, I think we as a commission ought to, ought to you know, look into the question you've raised, Chair Price, and look at uh, how might we assist the city. You know, what, what are the roles for us as individuals and or commissioners in helping the city work on this problem? You know, how can we help them? How can we help the staff? Thank you. Yeah, in terms of like, this doesn't necessarily help, doesn't directly help like a, a, a resident, but it would really help them keep the cost down is the working with the city on the permitting process and how that could be improved. You know, someone someone was suggesting maybe if someone electrifies, like they get to have pay zero, right? For the permits or they have like um, for the permit fees or, or someone said, well, maybe we should pay them, you know, instead of you know people paying for a permit, maybe it should be the opposite. There's a negative payment. So, that's something that's completely within the city's control. And so I'm sort of interested in that, the, that permit process, since there's like, we don't have to work with PCE, it's just the city. Um, oh, sorry. Well, so first of all, thank you both very much for the presentation. It was great. And it is a lot of useful data that I look forward to applying someday when I own a home of my own, but in the meantime, it better equips me to continue proselytizing um, home electrification to people I know who do who have homes. Um, and I guess I just wondered if you could, uh, what you started to touch on there in terms of what are other roles as commissioners that we can use to continue to promote this because you, started, you talked about um, education, if we can make these sorts of data more accessible to people and then the permitting, which I was going to ask about, but you, you already commented on that, Josie. But then, um, you know, we've discussed a burnout ordinance as a good next step for the city, but did any other, did any other good next directions as a commissioner, as a city, um, sort of crystallize out in the process of putting this together? Well, Tom. No, I'll speaking for myself. Um, uh, looking at this and also um, doing some research for legislation, it's you know becoming more clear to me that there are examples where the, in the state of California, some permit streamlining has happened and some extremely assistive documents have been written for how to help people get things done. One of the interesting things is, is standardized plans for how to bolt a house down and a standardized permit application because the state wanted people to have their houses bolted to the foundation, you know, to reduce earthquake uh, damage. And so that, you know, the government, when government's motivated to really get in there and help make projects happen, they figure out how to put in, put together the guide documents. And so, you know, doing what we can to encourage <laughs> development of, of uniform guide documents might be a, 
you know, a thing we can do. Um, but, you know, I think we're, you know, we're guinea pigs. We're able to, to go try experiments, do things, have findings and talk with uh, uh, policymakers about how to use those findings to make tools that help other people make progress. So would those guide documents be, um, the audience of those would be more contractors and installers, um, sort of to complement the, I feel like this guide is very, is focused in many ways on the individual looking to electrify their home. Right, so, you know, the, the type of guide that the state put out for bolting down houses is mostly geared towards contractors and building departments. So everyone could coordinate and, and then this, it just becomes like a cookie cutter. They're gonna use method B on this section and method D on that section of the house. And everyone understands what they're gonna do and the inspector knows what to look for. Um, and it's all comes together. So that's just you know, an example of one type of guide. And then in the presentation, Josie showed the, uh, the cover of this 90 page uh, guide for how to retrofit homes. That one's geared to really um, energy experts and homeowners. It was the, it's kind of a dual audience. Uh, some, so we're getting some criticism. It's too much of an expert bias. There's not enough simplicity to it because we went into depth. So anyway, more guides need to be written at different levels so that there is a consumer oriented guide. There can be a renter oriented guide. Uh, you know, so we're looking at producing more guides for more situations. The other thing that Tom and I have talked about is putting together packages, you know, like my house is pretty standard 1950s Menlo Park Rancher. And um, like there's certain, there's a heat pump water heater that, or a heat pump space heater that Mitsubishi makes. It's really high efficiency. It's only 17 rated amps on the, on the panel. So it's like really good. I have a hundred amp panel. It's really good for that. And um and it just swaps in really easily where like the indoor part where a gas furnace goes. So I could imagine putting together like a package for this type of house in Menlo Park and just saying, here are the four devices you need and here's the rough cost. And that being like something that we could hand out to people. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can imagine that would be useful, but. Yeah. Yeah. Even having virtual meetings like this one where a presentation gets made in the public you know, was broadly invited, say like the library events have a, a wider public notification, um, just to, you know, help familiarize people with the idea that these things are possible, they're, they're uh, affordable, and, you know, there are ways to move forward. But yeah, the, I mean, the reason obviously that we did this was to, to, to learn ourselves, um, if, if the city is, um, you know, Rebecca staff are working on a, looking at a burnout ordinance or alternatives to what are the policy options for um, requiring building electrification. And so this is a way for us to understand, well, what does the affordability look like? So that if the city moves in that direction, at least I feel more confident that, um, that it is affordable. But, but the policy mandate probably needs to happen in order for us to be able, oh, it definitely needs to happen in order for us to meet the 2030 deadline. Go ahead, Deb. Okay, so yeah, that was a great presentation and I do like the idea of doing like a condensed version or something that could either be given somewhere or that we could post on our on our website. Like I think there's a real opportunity for just some very low touch, you know, like not like just not overly complicated website design or whatever, just a way to get things like published somewhere or even on next door or whatever, because a lot of this is just kind of educating. Like you you covered a lot of myths that were in there that I think certainly hold true today. Um, both with consumers and even people who are getting their house built by contractors, those myths are kind of perpetrated, or like are continued on. So um, I just wonder, like, just a way to what could we do to get some of that great information that you put together just out in the hands of people who who need it? Like, can we post it on our website, or could we do a public webinar? Or like, those are great ideas. So how would we operationalize that? I guess. 
think Rebecca, that question might be directed at you too, is to understand what's possible. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Martin. It, it, it can be, I mean, if you go to our webpage right now with the, where the reach codes are, our last approval, it does have quite a few of the documents produced by Redwood Energy for reference for new construction. Um, and we've been working on the EV infrastructure page. Uh, and so we could easily add this as well um, to try to at least channel and funnel property owners to if they're gonna be where they're making upgrades to their existing buildings, to kind of access some of the information that's available. I did get a chance to read the the report as well, and it's, it's very it's very well done as all the other ones have been to help homeowners transition to electrification. So yeah, one one other thing. Oh, I was going to say one other thing I'll share is you know Tom and I did this model, and we've been kind of vetting it with all of these different. I mean, we presented it to the subcommittee at CCAG, um, the county organization with elected officials. We presented it to. Um, the carbon free Silicon Valley last night, we presented it to, um, you know, industry experts who are my, so we're getting a lot of input feedback, you know, refining assumptions, et cetera. And um, our plan, Tom and I's plan is to do some sort of like brief white paper, but then to just open source the model so that any person, any city who wants to use it could use it. So I just wanted to make that clear um because someone might be wondering like why should we why should we trust this and to the point of like um you know what what resources could we make available like we're planning to I mean, the purpose of this is to support menlo park and it's um you know trying to achieve carbon neutrality so thank you and i think i just wanted to clarify for this discussion what we're talking about putting what we're potentially talking about putting on the website or what information we were talking about because different information came up, right? We talked about the what Palo Alto has on their website. The, um, the Menlo Spark guide was included in Josie and Tom's presentation. Then we actually have Josie and Tom's presentation. So I just wanna make sure Rebecca, when you were mentioning what's going, what um, is already going on the website, not related to this information and then what we could add, are there any um, things to consider around what information, just so we're all on the same page. I don't think there, it, it, I mean, of course, we um, want to make sure that the information is is verified, right, and vetted before we put it on our, our government website. Um, but I, I know Commissioner Gellard and Cabot have research that we've talked with Ron uh, LaFrance, who's helping us with the uh, building electrification policy. Okay. Um, and so he's looked at the AMP diet. Um, and, you know, those are, those are all great aspects, I think, to really educate homeowners and property owners on how to electrify best. Um, and I think that's probably where the key differences are is, is when you're looking at a regulatory requirement, it doesn't necessarily say that you're going to do all these other things as part of that, but the customer and the industry certainly has those options. Um, and if they know about them, then that makes the transition easier, um, but it doesn't guarantee that they'll actually do all of those um, potential um, items that would save them money like battery storage or, or solar. So I think it is good to have that there so that we can always point them to. And that's what we're doing with the current reach codes when people are encountering issues is sending in the resources and pointing them to free technical assistance so that they can get over those hurdles and barriers. Because I think regardless, there's still going to be that challenge that people don't get educated until they have to. Um, and so, and once they have to, it becomes sort of a painful process, but then they are able to transition after that. Yeah. Okay, so basically all of the documents that we have talked about tonight would be eligible with verification to go onto the website, is that Correct. Yes, I, I would need to check with Clay Curtin, our public um, engagement manager, just to, to verify. But, I, you know, on it seems a tentative yes. <laughs> okay, okay. I just want to make sure because we talked about so many different documents. And so I just want to make sure we're on the same. And Tom, you have so, your hand. 
So part of tonight's presentation was really geared towards the commission, which is a policy advising body. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, the public is, you know, maybe they care about policy, maybe they just care about their house. So there, there's definitely a subset in there that's available and interesting to folks who care about their own homes. And then there's, it's surrounded in the presentation with a, a bunch of information for for policy advising bodies like our own about, oh, what are, what are the levers? What might we want to influence? And it could help citizens who want to get uh, active and become advocates, um, but it's, it goes beyond, you know, just how do I do my home? Yeah, that's true. But it would be easy to tailor the presentation more for just the building owner. Okay. Because I actually, the comment I was going to make, by the way, is I think it's a great presentation, but I think if we're going to put it on our website as a tool for people to like to help motivate them, we need to right size it. Like it, it, it needs to be cut down. Like what does the totally, agree. Or, totally right? agree. Right. So, so I, yeah. that's the only thing I was going to say is Ryan, I don't think I was necessarily suggesting as is put on there, but we could kind of flavor it up. So it's really for the average homeowner and they get the sense they should get is, wow, this isn't as expensive as I thought. There's lots of great, great resources. I'm, I, the, all those myths that were just um, out there are ones that I think are so ingrained still. So I think that if we just level it down to, uh, you know, those kind of key things of how do we get people to start switching their mindset and understanding um, that that's what I think would be really valuable. Yeah, and the great thing about a website potentially is, you know, we could have just the most basic information, the, the myths and the, it's not as expensive as you think. And, and then if people want to click on to, well, tell me more about solar, you know, like then we could have that whole like little sheet we had about the cost or whatever that they could click through and see that if they're interested, but that wouldn't be kind of the main thrust of it. But I totally agree. What we showed you guys, we're, we're showing you something because we know that you guys know a fair amount about this already and can get a little bit technical, but yeah, that wouldn't be, that it would have to be, you would definitely have to be a different subset for the, for just um, the public. And one thing I was gonna do too, was to reach out to PC because I know the technical assistance appears to be offered for electrification for new construction, but I'm not sure if that's available if you're gonna change out a water heater and you need some help. So that would be, that is something I'm trying to follow up on um, because it would be, it's always good to talk to somebody, a live person I, when you're trying I, to go through it. I think they even have a number now for EV charging through SMUD that anybody in the state can call if you're trying to figure out what kind of vehicle would be best. And so I think that was really helpful when you know, you're able to contact somebody and ask them about water heating or furnaces. Um, Cause I have watched so many YouTube videos about heat pumps. <laughs> <laughs> you, could, you could be the And making Rebecca. sure <laughs> that I understand which heat pump we're talking about. Is it for water heating or actual heating, heating the space <laughs> or pool for that matter? Yeah. Or, and when, when we can, clothes. that's right. <laughs> when we can gather between Tom and me and I, whoever, others of you, I'm sure we could um, actually go to people's houses and actually see the things. I, I, now that I've got my furnace replaced, I said, I want to have a little party, outside party. <laughs> People can check it out. Um, it's super quiet, by the way, this outside thing. Um, yeah, so I think, Rebecca, just a little uh, update. Bay Ren is doing on the phone, over the phone advice for people trying to swap out their water heaters. So that is something okay. that people can access through Bay Ren currently. But I, I don't know about HVAC or... Um, EV charging, I don't know about those, but I know for the water heaters, they, they are offering that. Oh, okay. well, that'd be I'm great if you could forward me out. any link, um, just so we could put that on there as well. And I could follow up with them as, too, if you can't get to it. Yep. Okay, so we, we is it, are there any other comments on the presentation or does anybody have any actions that they think we should take or recommend get taken based off of this item? Well, do, you, do we want to formally say, um, James, you know, oh, hold on. Oh, oh, sorry. Are you talking? He was the mute. He, he yeah. muted himself, but he was sorry. 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 Um, <laughs> um, yeah, well, I have, 
I have a technical question. Maybe I should have asked as a clarifying question, but if I could just for a minute. Um, I, I think I realized I'm still maybe a little confused about the AMP diet concept. And I just wanted to, I think I get the basic, um, and just correct me if I'm wrong. The basic idea is you have an AMP of a certain size. It's expensive to upgrade, so you don't want to do that. But adding a bunch of electric appliances would add enough amperage that most people would recommend that you get a bigger panel to accommodate them all simultaneously. But the idea is you don't need to necessarily you won't be using everything simultaneously, so you actually have sufficient amperage. Um, but I guess what I'm wondering is, do you need to add something that controls, is there like a controller that gets added on to make sure that you don't turn on everything simultaneously and exceed the amperage of the panel? Or is the diet just uh, In, planning around that? So it's a good question. In most cases, you don't need any special device to, to manage the loads. Um, if you have a bigger home and you want to stay on a hundred amp panel, you do, that was a 3000 uh, square foot home scenario. You do get into a situation where um, it might be good to have one of these uh, uh, circuit sharing devices that does do that intelligence of swapping from one to the other. But like in my house, I'm going to be able to have an EV charger, all everything electric, um, you know, stove dryer, uh, HVAC water heater. Um, I have a pool, so I have a pool pump, um, and I have a, uh, uh, a cabana accessory dwelling unit, and I and I will be able to do all of that on a hundred amps. So you and, and no no sharing, no intelligence, just a dumb panel. Okay. So and there so isn't any risk associated then with exceeding the amperage of your panel if for whatever reason everything right, around it. Yeah, so there still is a chance that you can trip the panel. It has a it has its main circuit breaker. If you go over the hundred amps, it'll it'll click off, mm -hmm. and and you go, oh, I need to turn something off, and then restart that panel. But um, the the National Electric Code has de you know coincidence factors for you know devices that tend to operate at the same time, and so the AMP diet is really just reading the electric code and applying it in a more clear way than it really reads as text and, and then just figuring out, oh, if those are the rules, then, then I, can, I can go this far and I'm still within the rules. And you know, that's, that's uh, all it is. Oh, okay. and, yeah, and, and also and, that there are certain devices that have low amps. And so maybe pick that version of the device instead of picking the common high amp version. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so there is a scenario where if you just had every light on, you had all four burners of your stove, both ovens on, your EV charger, your, your HVAC running max, your pool pump running max, there is a situation where you could flip your breaker, you know, or your fuse on your main panel. Um, but I've had like a high percentage of all those things I just told you going and it's like, barely a blip actually on my pg and &E, um, you know, seeing the total power. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. It wasn't until I was thinking through the actual technical implementation that I realized I didn't know how that worked. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Um, so this, this item is an information item. So I, we aren't necessarily having a motion on it, but I think informally, it seems like there's support for the presentation and the work that Josie and Tom are doing and that there also is support for having information like this, a version that's you know uh, more consumer friendly maybe, um, uh, or novice consumer friendly, I should say, um, uh, provided on the Menlo Park website. That's what I'm hearing. So I, I think if that's the case, um, you know, uh, there isn't formal action that we need to take, but it sounds like if the information is provided by Josie and Tom to Rebecca, that it's possible for this information to be added to the website. Does that sound like a positive outcome? Sounds good to me. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you all for listening. And if you have other questions or whatever, like, I think, can you, can you approach us? I don't know, <laughs> but um, it'd be great to, cause you guys are sort of the first Menlo Park residents hearing about this and you're a sounding board. So you're really important um, for us to keep hearing from. 
Right, and, and so maybe if you have suggestions, maybe you could forward them to Rebecca and, and uh, you know, we, we can uh, try to follow them. Yeah, I absolutely will. I'm about to start on the process as I think, um, at least I know Tom knows. And so um, I'm really excited to call the um, Bayran people and see if I can get some quotes on this. And I'm actually also working on the solar because we're doing a new roof. So I have to do the roof and then the solar and then this, and you know, it's a whole thing. So. Um, and even it was interesting because the solar people want to talk to the roof or the roof people want to talk to the solar people because they care about how the solar is installed because otherwise it invalidates the warranty on the roof. And so like that was kind of interesting. Uh, but it was nice that the roofing companies are much more familiar with solar and they were just like, oh, yeah, you know, you just need to talk to them. That's totally fine. Um, so that made me feel more comfortable than when we had installed our electric um are charging for our electric vehicle at our last house. And I got kind of the answer that <laughs> you were talking about the first time, like, well, you know, this is gonna mess everything up and then, 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 and I was like, why don't you come and look? And then it turned out it was actually really easy. And, um, but I, um, but it was much scarier for me as the consumer. Um, so anyway, I'm, I was appreciating how much more common solar is now and I'm excited that there's a phone number I can call because I feel very overwhelmed talking about the hot water tank. So it's good. I'll let you know how it goes. Um, if there are no um, other comments on this, then we can move to the next item on our agenda. Is that, do we have any other comments? No, okay, I don't see any hands. Um, so, um, what that means is we are on um, item E or section E, which is the, um, are there any reports from advisory uh, board members or staff since the last EQC meeting? Obviously we just had a formal present or an informal presentation um, of the work that the building subcommittee has been doing. Are there, is there anything else that we would want to, anybody wants to bring forward in this part of the agenda? And Deb, your hand is raised, but I don't know if it's raised from before. No, I just raised it now. I'm just oh, doing did. that because I think I feel like it's easier to flag to you if you ask that. So yeah, I just raised okay. it. Okay, <laughs> perfect. That's um, great. So yeah, I just wanted everybody to know, and I don't think I'm the only one, but I did attend the JPA meetings, both of them, and um, they were interesting. I got to learn a little bit more about the bridge and why, uh, you know, the current design is kind of creating this like bathtub effect. So when we do have floods, it, it really is not equipped to handle that. So they showed the new engineering design and kind of what that means for the, you know, the, the it looked to me like the um, creek would be more of a rock bed, like lots of rocks with some shrubs and they, you know, they had some somewhat nice visuals on it. Um, and then they, they also, of course, um, went over the trees in a, in a different meeting. And there was a lot of public, I mean, this is a, there was a lot of public um, attending that call. And so I do think, um, just to echo what was said in public comment, that it, and, and as has been tradition of the, com uh, the commission, whenever we have a scenario that involves a number of trees coming down, we generally get pr like pretty involved. Like we either do an ad hoc committee or, you know, so somebody would be bringing forth more detail. We might even want to, invite the JPA to come and, and talk. I mean, in years past, Janelle's not here to echo this, but like when PG, uh, pg e had to cut down something like 400 trees, we really, they, they, we really worked hand in hand. I think we were able to save quite a few trees. So I do think it warrants, if, if there's 220 or whatever the number is trees, I do think it warrants getting more understanding of that and seeing where it is possible to influence and per, perhaps protect more trees. Um, it will significantly change the, that area. Now, having said that, obviously flooding is important. So we, you know, we're, we can't just, um, we, we've never been in a situation just like with PG&E, like that was a safety issue. So we're, we're not gonna say you can't take, you know, we didn't have that position, but what we did have the position of was, how can we save the most amount of trees? There were quite a few trees that it sounded to me had to come down because of construction ramps and things of that nature. So I just, I don't know that there's been a lot of pressure to 
see if there's other, you know, like if there's a big tree and the ramp needs to go there, well, can the ramp be moved elsewhere? Like, I just don't know how much detail has been happened that way. And it seems to me that the public has gone and flagged trees um, that are that are set to come down just as a way to communicate to that to the public. So again, it, I, I don't know if anyone else had any feedback from that. It was more of a sort of, here's what we're doing. You know, it was like a one hour session. I, do, I wouldn't stop there. I mean, I think we do need to invite either Margaret Bruce. She's, she, she's, I've known Margaret for a long time. She did mention that they want a holistic approach. I think they're very willing to listen. And I just always like to be mindful that like my view as a, you know, been on the commission a long time is that we also reflect back what's important to the community. So when there's an issue that comes up, I know we spend a lot of time on climate change, which is great as we should, but the trees um, are, are also a you know that's a signature piece of Menlo Park and we have to be very involved in that and our commission needs to be front and center and see it as seen as a part like a, a body that's at least following that so that that was my perspective I don't know if others you know so that's one thing that I and I'll pause and let others comment and then the other thing I wanted to say is that I had a very nice conversation with the prospective EQC commissioner so I think he might have talked to many of you as well and um, I really think it would be great. This person had very much interest in green space and, and things of that nature. And I think we could really use that type of, like that would be a nice rounding out of our commission if we could get somebody like that. We've had other commission commissioners who've been very focused in those areas. And so I think that would be great. So I don't know how that goes, how we go about if we can. So this is maybe a question for Rebecca. I don't know if we can weigh in and comment on our opinions on you know trying to just gently suggest that maybe certain commissioners would be a good choice based on what we think collectively would be a good balance for the commission. So those are the only two things I have. So I'll leave it at that and um, see if anybody else has any comments about the JPA or the commissioner who may have contacted you. Or prospective commissioner. Perspective. Thank you. Um, we, um, Rebecca and I have also um, been trying to, I don't know, Rebecca, if you want to give an update on the JPA. Yeah, I can, Commissioner Price and Martin. So I've reached out to the city attorney and um, we're kind of in a, a gray area, I think, in trying to figure out what the EQC's role is just because of its decision-making authority over heritage tree appeals. So if, if this does get appealed, it would be heard by the EQC and there could be um, a perception that the GQC has already made a, a, a judgment or an opinion about the tree removals before an appeal has been heard. So I think that's the crux of the issue in trying to navigate um, what the EQC could do in this instance. And I, I do hear you, Commissioner Martin. I mean, there's been instances where um, the EQC has worked on large tree removals um, and even in development projects as well. So I, I think I just need to get more clarity from the city attorney and, and she did um, reply back. And I think her initial answer is if, if it's going to be a, in conflict with a potential appeal, then, then that's probably not doable. But again, I'm going to kind of give her some other context and other cases where we may have done that. And she had some questions. Uh, for me. Just, I just want to interject on that. I know she's new as well, but um, it, this in fact is not, a you know, this is, we have done the same thing with pg &E. They had to also submit um, appeal, you know, a hair, they had to submit the same process. Um, I don't think that's the correct way to look at this because we're, we're not, um, we, we are a advisory body and in the context of looking at the JPA, we would be looking at how they came to their decision, how we can weigh in, we, we you know, those types of things not in a, not in a, like a sort of um, activist way or whatever, like, you know, so I, I think that that's actually counter to what we've done on many, many projects when, when it's involved large tree, potentially large tree removals, we have been involved. And I think it's actually been very beneficial. And I don't think we've had any type of a conflict of interest type scenario. So I think it's really important to bring up all those case histories of, of how we traditionally, um, I, I also think the public kind of expects this of us to some degree. Um, as a commission, like we, we should be reflecting what's important to our community. So I, I would advocate, I would really kind of resist that um, kind of approach of thinking that 
we're somehow going to be impartial on the heritage tree part of it. Can I ask a clarifying question at this point um, regarding the, the tree removals? If, if, the, if the JPA is going to have to ask our permission for every single tree that they want removed? No. Okay. It's considered one project. Um, so similar to a thousand El Camino, each tree can be looked at individually in the context of the project, but it's one project. So they would come as a group, the trees. But they do have to get our approval for um, the project. I believe it's appealed. So oh, it, yes. and it's so it may depend on which trees are appealed. So um, the way the permitting works for tree removals. I want to say that you get a permit for each one and there's a certain cost for up to a certain amount. Um, so the community may want to appeal or even the JPA may want to appeal the city's arborist decision if, if, um, if they deny the, the removal to the mm -hmm. JPA. Okay. So that's where it gets very gray. I mean, as to who's going to potentially file the appeal and how the EQC will make a decision on that. But I, again, I hear Martin, Commissioner Martin's uh, comments and, and, and it wasn't a final answer from the city attorney, just to be clear. It was just trying to, to, to move through it. So your, what I understood from what you just said, Rebecca, was that the, it's a city arborist who makes the decision about whether the trees can come out or not. And then, so, go ahead. Rebecca, can you start from the beginning of the process? Because I think this is where it gets very confusing. So for a project like the JPA's project, there's, because there are different groups that hear different things, right? So there's the planning commission, there's city council, there's, um, and then there's the EQC. And would you feel comfortable kind of using this as a case example, not saying this is how it will happen, but kind of for all of us, making sure we understand what the process is. So um, is that okay to ask? Because I, I feel like this is where I, I totally understand where Leah's questions are coming from and I find this confusing also. Sure, Commissioner Price. So when a tree um, is uh, wanting to be removed by a property owner, or in this case, the JPA, they need to apply for a heritage tree removal permit. Um, there's a fee that goes along with that. The city arborist reviews the tree removal and based on criteria that's in the heritage tree ordinance, um, which is, is very um, defined uh, as to when a tree can be removed, particularly a healthy tree. Uh, and at that point, he'll make a decision um, Christian Bonner, who's our city arborist, as to whether it could be removed or not. And then the, if he denies the, the a heritage tree permit removal, then the permit applicant actually can appeal to the Environmental Quality Commission. So um, that's, that, that's a case where, where the city is saying, no, you cannot remove these trees, but the permit applicant is saying, I have to for X, Y, Z reasons. And then the commission weighs in on that. Um, and then if the commission can make a decision and that decision can then be appealed to the city council for the final decision on whether the tree is allowed to be removed or not. Um, and the other kind of case, if, if um, Mr. Bonner approves of a tree to be removed for a reason under the heritage tree ordinance, the community can appeal that. Um, because I, I think with heritage trees, it, it can get very tricky because sometimes there's different viewpoints or other kind of evidence um, that make it appealable um, because it's it can be a gray area whether it's causing property damage or the need to protect a, a neighborhood from flooding um, and so in that case a community member can appeal to and then the EQC goes through the same process the EQC makes a decision then it goes to city council if the appellant chooses to appeal the EQC's decision this only applies to heritage trees. So there are there are a number of trees that, when we talk about the 220 trees or whatever it is, mm. those are all the trees or only trees that have been identified as heritage trees? Yeah, and that's a great point, Commissioner Elkins. So yes, uh, if it is not of heritage tree size, then it wouldn't need a permit. Um, and in that case, yeah, I think that's where the gray area is to the commission 
you know, could potentially um, look at the matter in, in that regard. Uh, so I, I think there's some bandwidth there, but it's just, again, carefully navigating it in a way um, that it doesn't create a conflict for the commission. And okay. there are two hands raised. Leah, did you have another question? No, I'm through at the moment. Okay. I don't know who was first, but both Deb and Tom have their hands raised. Oh, Tom was first, Deb said, okay. Um, uh, thank you. Um, so uh, Ms. Lucky, I, I seem to recall um, a possible precedent case was, I think it was a Facebook project where they were going to do a significant amount of, of landscape rearrangement uh, and putting in a new bus turnaround or something like that. And so it's, it, my recollection is the whole project came to the EQC to be looked at um, and to get advice. And you know, I, I wonder if that's an example that the city attorney might want to look at as, uh, is that a route the project would take? Because I don't recall that being an appeal that we were hearing. I right, and I, I believe that was under their development agreement kind of package. Um, and in that, case it I, th I think there was a process issue there um, to, to navigate um, with approving the development agreement so yes the large developments where there's large tree removals and they need a development agreement then it it typically is brought before the commission um, but i believe then at that point um, it kind of eliminates the appeal ability to the commission mm -hmm. because the commission has already reviewed it and so that's what i'm working through um, with our city attorney as to, okay, well, if, if the commission does get involved, does that mean then it wouldn't, if there was an appeal, it wouldn't go to the commission, it would go to the city council directly, which is how we were processing the Facebook case. Thank you. Yeah, one thing I wanted to mention just um, so, and I, I don't know the ins and outs of the JPA, but like in the, if I think of pg e from what I remember that they had jurisdiction over that space, like where the trees were, we, they could have come in and just got rid of them all. Like, but they kind of wanted, they know that tr we're a tree city. So they came in more as, Hey, we want to work with you. We're going to do our best to um, minimize this. And, and we want your input. So we, we actually kind of engaged in a really nice collaboration of at least weighing in. And I think we were able to save a number of trees that maybe wouldn't have been done so in the so it was it was done in that sort of way and I think in the case of the JPA because it's now talking about a waterway like a creek like in flooding right so I don't know if it's the same scenario that this isn't like a homeowner coming to us this is like a in some ways it reminds me of the you know PG&E situation it's obviously different but I would see our involvement not so much in getting into the like which do we appeal versus not? And like that can get really contentious and that's not what I had in mind. Um, what I had in mind is more that we, especially Margaret, Bruce and the gang was, the, the group was very um, collaborative and holistic in wanting feedback. So it would, in my mind, it would be great to do, for instance, something like invite them to our meeting, get an understanding of what their plan is on the trees. And then we can ask questions. We could be like, okay, I noticed like, you know, that or we hear from the public that these particular trees are of great importance is there and we can probe and ask questions and sort of like help influence and in the end we may end up saving a few great trees or we may not but it's not um that's kind of more the spirit of, of what i was thinking we would do and what i've seen kind of work well in the past because this is a big project right and it's 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 being done for a purpose of, of flooding so it's it it, it has this very I don't even know who owns all the space in the creek bed itself. So I don't think we could, I don't know if it follows the same rules of a citizen can appeal and then we have to like, we're not gonna appeal 22, like sit through 22 tree appeals, God forbid, I would hope. So that that's kind of what I was thinking, Rebecca. Um, and just to, to everybody else, I'm only gonna be here for another month, but you know, that would be what I would recommend if we were to move forward. Thank you. And we have two more questions. We have Tom and, and Leah. And again, I'm, I apologize. I didn't see who went first. I think Tom did. Okay. okay very, very quickly, um, just to make a suggestion to Rebecca and the attorney to, to uh, consider whether it would 
be reasonable to have a meeting where the JPA presented for 20 minutes and uh, uh, people uh, disagreeing with the JPA had a 20 minute presentation time also, you know, kind of equal amounts of time for, uh, you know, two opposing viewpoints to present information about the plan and to try to, you know, both of them bring the EQC up to speed if that was the purpose of this, of that, and, and then soliciting our advice if anyone wanted our advice. Yes, I can definitely uh, reach out and, and add that, that ask. I, I mean, that's typically what we do through the appeal process as well. We give equal amount of time. And Leah. Uh, so it, this kind of going back to what I was asking in the first place, it, um, is the question um, settled that we, that we have jurisdiction over these trees or as Deb was alluding to, is this, is this the creek and does the JPA have jurisdiction over it? And, and are, are they just being nice by asking for our opinion? Well, so I, I um, my understanding is that it's the water districts kind of, um, piece of land to, to manage and well, much uh, of no, the tree you know, is, yeah that's I think it's the question but when I had reviewed the EIR I, I, I believe it was made clear through the comments from the city back um, to the JPA which is that they would need to get um, heritage tree um, removal permits for, for trees that are of heritage size um, that are within Menlo Park city boundaries so I'd have to do a little bit more digging and just, um, I don't think I was here for the PG&E tree removal. It's probably bef right when I was coming back um, from that. And cause I would I'm think too sure that they the also, they also had to get here to permits. They, yeah, I'm pretty sure. I okay. can verify, but, or we could go back. And look. But that was probably a little bit more clear about it being within the, the city of Menlo Park. And here we're not really quite sure where, where is the, Border is in the middle of the creek. Is it on that? Oh, yeah. I think it's shared. It's a shared border between Palo Alto and the city. But don't quote me on that. I can, I could find out more. But I believe that's how it, I've done a few creek cleanups and trying to understand the creek. <laughs> but not. It's not a like a DMZ or you know that only belongs to the JPA. It is. It is Palo Alto and Menlo Park. I believe so. But I, I'll follow up for you, Commissioner Elkins. And Get some more clarity. Okay. Is the EIR still being litigated as well? I'm not sure. I, okay. I so I know um, our public works director Nikki Nagaya. She's the lead on on the project. It was my so I can check with her from the um, meeting that it was still being litigated. That's what I I think they were hopeful, but I don't know if it actually got resolved. Okay, so yeah, clearly there are a lot of different dynamics in this project and. We know we've heard a lot of public opinion about it as well. And so we know that it's really important. And um, I wasn't able to watch the meetings live, but I've watched one of the recorded and I need to watch the other recorded meeting. Um, so I've, you know, I think it's, I've taken uh, on also following it along because I think it is important. Um, but yes, um, I think you're, everyone's comments are really well received and we'll look for guidance from the city attorney to figure out what the next steps are and, and to continue to voice um, the past precedent as an example of, of future action that we can take um, as well. Um, are there any other updates? Um, we're at 8.10. Really quick. Um, Mark Berman's office submitted uh, AB 1346, which would uh, outlaw or ask CARB, I think, to outlaw um, gas leaf blowers, gas powered leaf blowers. And Leah may know, you know, I know this is your um, something that you've worked on. So tell me what I get wrong here. But um, I think it was a kind of a soon in year, like 2025. Is that right? Um, anyway, so I was wondering 
it may be something that the council, you know, can the city, does the city want to endorse that since that is an issue that we know our residents care a lot about and we have struggled to figure out how we would enforce it and having it be a state law would kind of take away the issue, I think, for us. Um, so do, do we want to recommend, for example, to the city council that they endorse the bill? Um, maybe that's something we can put on the agenda for another I think that would be a future agenda item. Yeah. Can I, uh, I, could just, I can volunteer to look into that some more. I've already written an email to um, Berman's office asking for clarification of that, what exactly it is they're doing. Because when you go online and try to find um, information about this AB 1346 or whatever it is, it refers to election laws and nothing to do with leaf blowers, in, in fact. Um, so oh. I've written to them and asked them to tell me what's going on, if they're, maybe they're still drafting this or not. Um, but in any event, whatever, what I, the PDF that I had received um, from um, one of the council members actually um, indicated that it would just, it's basically a burnout, that it would stop the sale of gas leaf blowers at a certain date, which I think was 2030, but I could be wrong about that. Um, and with gas leaf blowers having a lifespan of up to 10 years, that's you know pretty much ineffective in my opinion. Um, so there we are, but I could, I could volunteer to um, find out more about this and report back. Okay. If that's okay, if everybody would appreciate that or want me to do that. I mean, we, it's very much of interest to people um, in the in the community, so I think it's great to know more about what's going on. Um, and then, when you do, if you don't mind, um, just letting me, me or Janelle know so we can work with Rebecca on what uh, agenda process would be the right sure. process. I, I think if the city were to endorse it, you know, the, in terms of the cycle of the legislature, like sooner would be better you know, if the city wanted, you know, I don't know where we land, but if we wanted to recommend that the city endorse it, I think it's sooner rather than later would be yes. better. I agree with that. However, at this point, it doesn't even seem to exist. So there's not much to get behind at this point, but I'll, I'll let you know. Okay. Thank Another, you. just one other update from me or a request, actually. Um, I was speaking to Vicki Sherman in Redwood City about um, their, they passed a cap uh, recently, and she's putting together all their metrics um, to report to the city council on sort of how they're doing. And I was like, oh, well, what are we doing? And so, Rebecca, I wanted to ask, um, is anyone on staff kind of starting to track the metrics that we set out in the cap? Because I think we're, we're close to the one year well, we're, we're going to be, July will be here before we know it. And I think we said that the cap metrics would be reported to council once a year. Yes, we have started that to work. So okay. actually this month. Great. That's it for me. Mm -hmm. And then I just, I have two updates. So um, next Tuesday, the city council is, is going to have their regular meeting, I believe at five or six. Um, and they're going to um, be looking at uh, the CAP progress for goals one through six. So just where we are, um, what progress we've made and what are the next steps and then just possible council actions and you know how to potentially expedite um, some of the CAP action items, I think particularly for number one. So what are the options or what are the trade-offs in doing so? And then there is going to be an informational item as well for the renewable microgrid. So that's the solar battery storage for the new Menlo Park Community Center. And so it's just providing the council some information of when the RFP is gonna be released and how the process is going to look and, and when an award um, will happen. And then I believe in, I'm sorry, and then I believe in April, then it is, I was trying to look up the date, but the EQC to your work plan will go before council as well. So I'll just connect with you, Commissioner, or Chair Price um, on that, just to make sure it's on your calendar. Okay. And, okay. Rebecca, can I ask, uh, the report that is going to council, and I know there was another one on the cap number one that went to council, but we didn't see it. Like we haven't seen the update. Um, 
is there a way for us to see those before they go to council? I there is. It, it needs to be directed by council, and I I I. I think there's also understanding the impacts of time as well since the commission meets once a month um, on how to, to get those forward. And, uh, you know, it was not a slight to the commission. It was just um, reaction to the council asking for information um, because we were going through the mid budget uh, uh, amendments or appropriations. And then there was questions that came up about the progress on cap one. So that was kind of the basis to, to provide an informational item to the city council of, of where that was. And again, informational items help the council understand where the project is and if there's any questions or any changes in directions, then we can bring it back to them um, and discuss it some more. And I can't, Deborah, are you, is your- Yeah, I just have one last reminder. Okay. I'm sure you guys all saw it, that Arbor Day, um, we have, there's a tree planting event on March, um, my calendar. 27th. It's okay. And is it 27th? Yeah. Yes. So at 10 o'clock, I think. On, and it's, it's, it's 930. I think 930. Yeah. Via Zoom. Yes. That'll be interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm planning We're on attending practicing. that. Hmm? Joanna and I are practicing tomorrow <laughs> or on Friday morning. <laughs> Are you going to show us a shovel and like a little picture of a tree or something? I don't know. We're like practicing the process. It'll be fun. Um, yeah. <laughs> I do know to Deb's point, I know that the, um, I think for anybody that subscribed, um, I think it did go out in the Menlo Park community um, I don't know if it's a newsletter or an email blast or something like that, but I know people had gotten it that way. So, um, so hopefully people know about it and if they want to participate, they, they can join in. And this is related to the canopy project, which is, I think the part, or sorry, to the Thousand Oak Camino replanting, which is, I think an important part. And if you didn't see on the city's website, when it talks about the event, it does talk about how this is part of that replanting. So again, for people who um, have expressed interest, and I, I sent this to Peter um, Edmonds as well, um, individually. So I think it's just good to remember if people have commented to us or you know that they care about them, you know them in the community, letting them know that this is related so people can see that trees are being replanted. Okay. Um, if that's everything, then we can adjourn our meeting at 8.19 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Have a good night. Thank you. Nice. Yep. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you.